If you're like us, you've probably seen references to something called Munchausen's by proxy and been curious without really understanding what it is or how it may affect people. That's why we were excited to hear about the new podcast, Nobody Should Believe Me. The host, novelist Andrea Dunlop, takes an in-depth look at this subject. No one has ever done this before. She talks with people who have been affected by this condition. She even speaks with a perpetrator. We've already listened to the first two episodes, and we can tell you that Andrea doesn't dwell on the darkness. She takes great pains not to be gory or exploitative. This show has heart. It focuses on the humanity of everyone involved. And what makes this podcast extra special is that Andrea has a deeply personal connection to this subject. Someone very close to her was investigated for Munchausen by proxy. That gives the show a real emotional punch. When Andrea is listening to people tell stories about how they've been affected by this condition, she is not some uninvolved outsider. She has lived through the very same pain they have. She understands them. And through this podcast, she helps all of us understand them too. New episodes drop every Thursday. Listen and subscribe to Nobody Should Believe Me on Apple Podcasts or wherever you listen to podcasts. New York State Route 22 cuts past a lonely spot in Dutchess County. The day we visited, a brisk afternoon in late January, the sky was a deep blue. A hardened layer of snow clung to the ground all around us. Across the way, a field stretched up into a forested crest. We'd driven over an hour to reach this place, without any certainty that we'd find it. A search of newspapers.com only revealed that the cattle car restaurant sat somewhere between Wingdale and Pauling, along Route 22. That was too vague for our navigational abilities, so we dug deeper. Sitting in our apartment in Brooklyn, I plopped myself onto the Pauling border using Street View on Google Maps. Then, it was just a matter of dashing along Route 22 for what felt like a hundred clicks. I zoomed until I saw a small building. The low-slung structure looked familiar, like it might be the same one captured in the black-and-white photo of the cattle car restaurant, the only snapshot of the eatery I could find online. Kevin and I weren't sure it was the right place until we got there, though. It looked quite different, after all. Today, it's a landscaping business. Out front, it's got a sign, flagpoles, and a frozen, walled-in pond, a testament to the proprietor's craftsmanship. But if you stand across the street, you can glimpse the ridge of trees in the distance behind the building, the crisscross of the electrical wires. You can see the cattle car, a changed building, but the same place shown in the old photo. This is the place where 49-year-old Emil R. Zanaboni was murdered. He died in this lonely spot on a dark winter's night half a century ago. And, to this day, no one knows why. My name is Anya Kane. And I'm Kevin Greenlee. And this is The Murder Sheet, a weekly true crime podcast. Anya and I connected over the Burger Chef murders, a 1978 unsolved case involving the killings of four young restaurant employees. Now we're looking to track restaurant homicides. To help us understand the patterns of these crimes, we created a spreadsheet of nearly a thousand eatery-related killings, The Murder Sheet. We'll be drawing on that data throughout Season 1 to give you a deep dive into undercovered crimes. We don't just rely on skimming the headlines. We dive into these cases to bring you in-depth coverage. We're The Murder Sheet, and this is 
the killing at the cattle car, the unsolved murder of Emil Zanaboni. At around 10.30 p.m. on January 9th, 1971, an employee of the cattle car restaurant on Route 22 clocked out. They left behind their boss, Emil Zanaboni, cleaning the bar. During the winter off-season, Zanaboni, who went by Bob, usually tended the eatery's watering hole. That's one version of the story, but a 2003 Poughkeepsie Journal article had more details. That piece said that Zanaboni... A waitress and a cook served a late dinner party that night. The last customer cleared off around 10.20 p.m., and the waitress and the cook left then as well. Either way, Zanaboni was last seen around 10.30 p.m. He hadn't come home that night, and that just wasn't like him, his daughter Malda told Poughkeepsie Journal reporter Rashid Oluwa back in 2003. The next morning, the 18-year-old Malda and her mother Dorothy left the family's nearby River Road house, and arrived at the restaurant around 7.30 a.m. The inside was a mess. Bar stools toppled, coin boxes torn from the jukebox and the cigarette machine. And then Dorothy started crying. Zanaboni was still in the ransacked restaurant, dead near the bar. He'd been shot three times in the torso, including once in the heart. The weapon was a twenty two caliber firearm, although whether it was a rifle or a pistol is not clear. New York State Police responded to the call and have been working the unsolved case ever since. Here's Abbott Brandt, who covered the case as a reporter for the Poughkeepsie Journal. Abbott recently did a Zoom interview with us about what it was like to report on a nearly 50-year-old cold case and how the Hudson Valley community reacted. I think people are were just shocked, but there was there were also some people who were like, I remember this, you know, older people, of course, but I think people love cold cases. And but I think when it happens in your area, there's kind of this conflicting thing where you're like, I'm so interested in this, but I'm I'm so upset for my community that had to endure this. And I think that there was almost a level of frustration where People were like, you know, oh, I lived in that area. Because, of course, you read the comments. You got to read the comments. And people were like, oh, I lived in that area. You know, I remember that that restaurant. But, you know, X, Y, Z, like, I wish I had heard something. And it's like, you know, it's so long ago. Um, but at the end of the day, that's what you hope. You hope that someone for some reason was there in that proximity to the restaurant and had heard something and was able to help. That's why you do it. But you know, I definitely feel like sometimes people wish they could do more because it, it is very upsetting. And it's crazy because I think if anyone had a loved one murdered and to deal with that for for 50 years at this point, um, it's crazy. Brandt previously worked for the Poughkeepsie Journal, the second oldest newspaper in the United States. It serves the Hudson Valley region of New York State. She was a breaking news reporter covering everything from traffic snarls, weather updates, local human interest features, and, of course, the crime beat. Despite her busy schedule, she found herself drawn to cover the region's cold cases. At that time, state police were starting to feature crimes on social media as part of a Cold Case Tuesday program in a bid to drum up leads. So in many instances, these cases uh, were decades old, and that information never had the opportunity to reach the number of people in the area that it could reach today um, had the internet and social platforms been present. So um, the idea just being that even though this particular case had happened almost 50 years ago at the time, it may just take 
um, a photo or one description for someone to be like, hey, you know, I saw something that night. I knew that many people who lived in Dutchess County had lived there for a long time. So even though they might not have a direct connection to the case, um, maybe they had recalled hearing something about it many years ago or just found the fact that a cold case was still happening in their county to be interesting. Brandt got to work looking into the cold cases herself, leveraging the Poughkeepsie Journal's archives in her own reporting. Perhaps her interest wasn't too surprising, given the fact she's the daughter of a police detective. What I had done was take the information in the original release that they had provided and began looking through our digital archives, which thank God, you know, somebody had the foresight to put all those archives digitally, you know, years and years. Um, I believe the Poughkeepsie Journal is the second oldest newspaper in the country. So there's a lot of material. Um, And some of our tangible archives I even looked at, which were stored away in the journal basement, um, just to see what I could find in terms of original reporting on the incident and what the police said at that time. That way, when we did reach out, to, when I did reach out to the police about any additional information they might be able to provide or would be willing to provide, we're able to say, you know, we know that XYZ was found at the crime scene. The original report said such and such. Is there anything else you can add on to this? Or is there anything else that has changed? Because oftentimes you can go in blind or, you know, say, tell me what I what I need to know. And they say, well, we did, we sent you the press release, right? Um, So especially with an agency like the state police, what they put out to the media and ultimately the public is very deliberate and purposeful. Um, So being able to do that kind of archival research into previous reporting and police statements allows us, I think, to bring a little bit more life and context into the story. And the more you can connect people with the story and what actually happened, I feel like the more invested they'll be in the case and um, its ability to be solved. So that was kind of important to, for me to find any pieces I could that weren't being provided by police and kind of use them to flush out um, what happened that night. Speaking with Abbott for the show, we all agreed that it's a weird crime. Some facts seem to point to a stranger killing. Others point to someone much closer. In the stranger category, you can put the location. The restaurant was isolated, the perfect target for a robbery, from what we could see. But then you think, well, if I'm a smart criminal, where would I go to commit a crime? (laughs) You know, it's like probably where there's not a lot of people around. And, you know, if if I know that this is a, a restaurant that does well, maybe I will go, you know, so. And it's not as if the cattle car was completely secluded. It's situated just off the Appalachian Trail a popular marked hiking trail that follows the East Coast between Georgia and Maine. The towns of Pauling and Wingdale both have their own Metro North commuter railway stations on the Harlem line. And, of course, there's the highway. New York State Route 22 is a two-lane road that runs nearly the entire length of the state's largely rural eastern border for over 337 miles, from the Bronx to near Canada. Could a drifter, or someone with a job that required travel along that route, have seen an opportunity in the darkened form of the cattle car restaurant? Let's take a quick break from the murder sheet to tell you about a podcast investigating yet another unforgettable crime. The Orange Tree is a seven-part series about a 2005 homicide that happened near the University of Texas at Austin. The murder of 21-year-old Jennifer Cave, who was shot, dismembered, and left in a bathtub at her friend Colton Petoniak's apartment, continues to haunt the area to this day. Like the Burger Chef murders, this case features plenty of twists and turns, including Colton's flight to Mexico with another UT student, Laura Hall. Both were later convicted in connection with the crime, although Colton has continued to appeal his verdict and claim innocence. The business student turned convicted murderer now says that he doesn't even remember much about the night Jennifer died. The Orange Tree is reported on and produced by Haley Butler and Tanu Thomas, who were both seniors at the University of Texas when they started this project. 
Together, Haley and Tanu strive to piece together this tragic story in an in-depth podcast that features audio from courtroom scenes and interrogation rooms, prison phone calls, and exclusive interviews with both the perpetrators and the victim's family. You can binge all seven episodes of The Orange Tree today on Apple Podcasts or wherever you listen to podcasts. And now, back to the murder sheet. What seems more strange to us are the clues pointing to a connection between Zanaboni and his killer. We know from compiling a list of hundreds of restaurant murders that most of these homicides are perpetuated by non-strangers. Disgruntled or recently fired employees, business partners busy cooking the books, that sort of thing. How did the killer know when to get Zanaboni alone? Or was that a coincidence? Who exactly was the employee or employees who last saw Zanaboni? But more than that, there are certain details about this crime that are just strange. Zanaboni was known to carry large amounts of cash on him, but it has been reported that no money was found on his body. His pockets were turned out, though. That could speak to inside knowledge, although it's also possible that a stranger could have just lucked out. The coin boxes from the cigarette machines and jukebox were smashed. All that destruction just for some coins? That could speak to desperation. Then again, there was more than enough money found within the restaurant to cover the place's receipts for that day. Did the perp just miss that? Or was the killing about something more than just money? Other details remain less clear. We mentioned that Zanaboni was found with no money on him. Well, the 2003 article disputes that fact saying he had around $600 on him that night. We're not sure which is true. Media reports sometimes inadvertently confuse details. Is it possible that the $600 mentioned there was actually the amount found in receipts in the restaurant? And regarding the receipts, were those funds found in the cash register or elsewhere? In terms of the crime scene, Zanaboni's car was found out of gas in the parking lot, left with the engine running all night. Did the murderer accost him as he was trying to leave the parking lot and use trickery or force to get the restaurant owner back inside? Or was Zanaboni just trying to warm up his vehicle in the dead of an upstate New York winter? The facts of the crime seem too hazy to allow for any real informed speculation. Suffice to say that elements of the crime were very odd. And what of Zanaboni himself? Before he came to the cattle car restaurant, he ran eateries in Westchester County including at least one in Hartsdale. His lease reportedly ran out in 1969, so Zanaboni moved the family to Pauling and bought the former Kentucky Inn. The restaurateur only owned cattle car for about a year before he was killed, but his eatery was listed as hosting the annual venison dinner party for the local police. As for why Zanaboni and his family settled in Dutchess County, Malda said that Dorothy hailed from the nearby Putnam County town of Brewster and that her parents had long talked about moving upstate. Could something more sinister than an interest in a bucolic change of scenery have been behind that move? Could something or someone have followed Zanaboni up from his past businesses in Westchester, a shadow creeping up along Route 22 towards his new venture? And then there's that 2003 Poughkeepsie Journal article. In it, Malda says that the family attempted to keep the cattle car restaurant running after her father's murder. But her mother Dorothy was robbed in the parking lot and had her house burned down. A horrible set of coincidences? A warning from the killers? Or were these things just indicative of the possibility that running a business along Route 22 was more dangerous than imagined. There was another cold case where a gas station in Wingdale, you know, the town right over in the same general area, um, someone was murdered there. And um, that's an ongoing cold case. He was he was robbed, um, murdered. And, you know, I think it's valid to wonder if this is something not necessarily connected, but um, in terms of a case where you have people that can easily come and go after committing a crime and especially as I mentioned in a place that's not very populated and you know doesn't have lots of street lights um I've been in Pauling it's it's not a place where you know if you hear a couple gunshots at night it wouldn't be the craziest thing you know these are places where 
you know, people are shooting guns and hunting and, and things like that. So I think all of that um, should be considered, but I don't know if it necessarily is tied to that in any way. Abbott also covered the murder of Leonard Manette, who was killed on November 17, 1971, in Wingdale. Both murders targeted middle-aged men working late at businesses in the area. But Manette hadn't been shot. He'd been stabbed and left with head injuries. We've linked to all of Abbott's reporting and our other sources in our show notes. So where does the Zanaboni case stand today? Well, we talked with New York State police representatives on the phone, and they gave us a statement to share on the status of the investigation. The death of Zanaboni continues to be actively investigated by police, the police spokesperson said in the statement. Numerous leads have been followed up on throughout this investigation. However, this homicide has never been solved. If you have information on the case, you can call the New York State Police Bureau of a Criminal Investigation in Dover at 845-677-7300 or 845-877-3660. Please refer to SJS number 3025018. And remember, your call can be kept confidential. We'll also be including this information in our show notes and social media posts about this episode. Well, I feel like I feel like any time I've ever asked law enforcement that, you know, they really stress the fact that it really takes one person to see one thing, just the smallest inkling of anything. And, and that's the reason why they do put out these releases, because, you know, you might not think, you know, oh, I saw I saw a green car, you know, and you might not know that that's the missing piece to the puzzle. Um, So I think I don't know exactly what that piece would be in this case, um, but I think and would encourage anyone with any information as unrelated as it may be um, to come forward because you really never know what that could lead to. If you're wobbling back and forth on whether or not to pick up the phone, just think about the fact that some of Zanaboni's loved ones have passed away themselves without receiving any answers about his death. One of his sons died suddenly in 1998, and his wife Dorothy passed away in 2008. We reached out to four of Zanaboni's surviving children, including Malda, on Facebook, sending messages to all of them, now adults with their own careers, children, and grandkids, felt like a fraught task. It always is with surviving loved ones of murder victims. It's been a nightmare, Malda told the Poughkeepsie Journal back in 2003. I figure if anyone had information, they would have come forward by now. The loved ones of murder victims don't owe it to anyone to retell their pain year after year. At the same time, as journalists, we don't want to assume anything. Relatives, especially those whose loved ones have cases that have gone cold, sometimes want to speak out. No one responded this time. Everything we learned about Zanaboni himself came from media reports. The case attracted some attention back in the 1970s, but the coverage waned over time until Abbott's reporting brought the case back into the spotlight. In some ways, looking into a case like the murder of Emile Zanaboni can be frustrating. But this is why we want to cover more obscure crimes, as well as unsolved cases. We want to spark these conversations about cases that deserve more attention. Zanaboni was a native of Brighton, Massachusetts, a Marine who served in World War II, a cook turned restaurant owner, and a father of seven. Somebody killed him 50 years ago. Someone was allowed to murder this man and vanish into the night. And we don't know why. But he mattered, and so does uncovering the truth about his death. When Anya and I visit murder sites to get audio for the murder sheet, it's often, ultimately, a depressing task. So many are located in these anonymous strip malls. They almost blend in together as we try to chronicle the spots where a person lost their life. But the cattle car was different. 
That place along the Dutchess County roadside gave off a haunting feeling. I grew up alongside Route 22, which is called White Plains Road in my hometown. It's a road I'd cross at least once a day to go to school or work. Sometimes, walking home from an office happy hour or late night at the newsroom, I'd end up cutting across 22 late, when there were absolutely no headlights in sight. A few times, I'd stop at the double yellow lines and pause for a minute to stare down the road into the tree-lined darkness. I don't really know why or what I was hoping I'd see. That's what I thought about as we visited the Zanaboni murder site. How I lived just down the street, essentially, an hour by car, a little less than a day by foot, to the land between Pauling and Wingdale, to that place upstate. Looking off into the woods on either side of the former cattle car, I thought about how remote the place seemed and how incomprehensibly lonely it must have felt to Bob Zanaboni on the night he was killed. Thanks for listening to this episode of The Murder Sheet. Special thanks to Kevin Tyler Greenlee, who composed the music for The Murder Sheet, and who you can find on the web at kevintg.com. To keep up with the latest on The Murder Sheet, please make sure to follow us on Instagram and Twitter at Murder Sheet, and on Facebook at M Sheet Podcast or by searching Murder Sheet. For exclusive content like bonus episodes and case files, become a patron of The Murder Sheet on Patreon at patreon.com slash murder sheet. If you enjoyed listening to The Murder Sheet, please leave us a five-star review to help us gain more exposure. And send tips, suggestions, and feedback to murdersheet at gmail.com. Thanks so much for listening.